Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lamia Barakat. I'm a pediatric psychologist and I direct psychosocial services and behavioral oncology research for the Cancer Center. It is our uh, pleasure to uh, host this third in our patient family, uh, CHOP Cancer Center Town Hall for you today. Um, and today we're, we're addressing an issue that I think is near and dear to our hearts as we think about treating the whole child during uh, cancer treatment and the cancer journey, um, as well as I think uh, an area where caregivers um, and sometimes patients themselves have a lot of concerns about what is the typical experience from an emotional point of view uh, when someone, when a child is diagnosed with cancer. What can the family expect, not only at diagnosis, but during treatment and then potentially beyond that? And so we're really happy to welcome you here today for a discussion about those questions and concerns, uh, a sharing of information about what we know in terms of how resilient our children, adolescents, and young adults can be as they traverse cancer, but also the ways in which we as a team, the ways in which you as caregivers, and the ways in which our broader team can help support children, adolescents, and young adults through cancer while supporting their thriving um, and their continuing on their developmental trajectories as they go. So uh, we're really happy to have here today one of our pediatric psychologists and one of our child and adolescent psychiatrists who work with our patients and families. So I'm going to introduce them and then I'm going to turn over the town hall to them um, to get started. So Dr. Natalie Nagib is a pediatric psychologist with the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And she's also a, a psychologist within our cancer center, providing services primarily at our Voorhees Specialty Care Center. Dr. Nagib has specialized in the provision of psychosocial care to children and adults managing chronic health conditions for seven years. She currently provides assessment, intervention, and consultation services to children with oncological and hematological conditions. She has a background in family systems therapy that informs her work with families as they manage their medical journey. Dr. Nagib completed her graduate training at Chestnut Hill College and her internship and fellowship years at the Pennsylvania Hospital. Welcome, Dr. Nagib. And then we also have with us Dr. Meredith McGregor. She attended medical school at the Eichen School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City, and then completed a combined residency in pediatrics, adult psychiatry, and child and adolescent psychiatry at the Mount Sinai Medical Center. After residency, she completed a fellowship in psycho-oncology and consultation liaison psychiatry at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She started her career as an attending psychiatrist at Memorial Sloan Kettering, doing psychiatric evaluations and longitudinal care for children, teenagers, and young adults with cancer and their families. She came to CHOP in 2019 and has been dividing her time between the inpatient psychiatry consult service and the pediatric health and behavior clinic, where she sees children and teenagers referred for psychiatric evaluation by the subspecialty teams at CHOP. The focus of her clinical care, teaching, and research continue to be in pediatric psychosocial oncology. So welcome both of you. We're, you all are going to get started. And as you pull up your presentation, I just want to invite those who are attending to share questions via the Q&A function on your um, Blue Jeans screen. And uh, Drs. Nagib, and McGregor have indicated that they uh, really invite you to ask questions as we go, not necessarily save your questions to the end. We are hoping as much as possible that this uh, town hall can be conversational and interactive. So please bear your questions during uh, as they go. And um, between the three of us, we're going to be monitoring the Q&A and um, trying to have a conversation about the things that are on your mind. So with that, I'll turn it over to the two of you. Thank you so much. Um, does this, I'm, I'm sharing my screen now, I hope, so I can't see what everyone's seeing. Does this look all right? Can you see the, the slides, Natalie? I, yep, I can see them. Yes. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Um, we are we're really excited to be here today and to be talking with all of you. Um, we wish we could 
be together in person. Um, as Dr. Barak had said, we do want to make this um, as close to what a what an in-person conversation would be like, and really would love to hear your questions as you go, but um, as we go, but also happy to take questions at the end as well. So today we're going to be talking about um, looking out for your child's emotional well-being. Um, we have a little overview of the talk today, um, and the most important uh, take-home message we want to emphasize and that we'll emphasize throughout the talk is that children are resilient and um, most do really well, even in the face of something as serious as cancer diagnosis and treatment. Of course, this doesn't mean that there are no bad days. Um, some distress is expected, and we'll spend some time reviewing what that may look like um, and, and ways that you might see that expressed. Um, we'll review ways that you can emotionally support um, your child. And when I say child here, I'll, I'll, I'll step back to say referring to a child, a teenager, a young adult. Um, the ways that you can support your child during treatment, and um, you'll find that that looks a lot like all the things you know how to do as a, as a caregiver already, um, because you really know your child and, and teen best. But we'll, we'll offer some tips as well. Um, we'll talk about signs to look out for that might mean that your child could benefit from the more targeted or clinical psychosocial intervention as they go through treatment. Um, and we'll talk about our uh, psychosocial oncology psychosocial team at CHOP, who we are, um, and what we can do. Get started. As, as I said, uh, as I said before, um, most of the news is good news. Most children who are diagnosed with cancer do well from an emotional standpoint with basic supports, and that means the type of support that you offer them as caregivers, as family members. Maybe we even have some friends of family members um, out there watching and listening. And with the standard supports that we offer to all families uh, who are going through treatment. And at the same time, um, having cancer does put uh, kids and teenagers and young adults at higher risk for some emotional difficulties such as anxiety and depression. Um, and so it's important to be informed and prepared in case, um, in case that comes up so you know what to do. <laughs> and, um, not to overstate the point, the most people do well, but this is this is a graphic that that I love that shows what we really see day in and day out working with with these kids, these teenagers, these young adults with cancer. We see resilience um, or the ability to adapt in the face of adversity, and and there are there are kids who develop more significant distress, even to the point of having um, you know, uh, anxiety or depression or um, post-traumatic stress symptoms. And while those can be hard topics to, um, to think about and to talk about, we want to talk about them here so that you can know what to look for, so that you can feel comfortable reaching out if you have concerns, and to know that there are ways to help. On the right side <laughs> of, the, of the graphic um, is one of my favorite topics, post-traumatic growth. And Dr. Nagy will talk more about that um, towards the end of the presentation. But it's this amazing, really, phenomenon that we see in these kids who will identify positive change and growth that came, that, that they experienced going through something like, like cancer treatment. And while this picture shows sort of post-traumatic growth on one side and, and anxiety and depression and post-traumatic stress on, on the other side, they actually aren't mutually exclusive. And, and some of the, the kids who um, may struggle with some of the anxiety or depression during the course of treatment are the same ones who may identify um, post-traumatic growth in the long run. So, so why is it that some children um, seem to be more resilient and some may need additional support? In pediatric behavioral health, um, we don't think of the child on their own in a vacuum, but as part of a system. And that's what this, these concentric circles, well, not exactly concentric, these, these circles represent. Um, there are factors about the child, the family, the community, um, including friends, peers, schools, the world around them that contribute 
how they react going through treatment. I mean, an obvious example right now is that a child going through cancer treatment during a pandemic is going to have a very different experience than even the same child going through treatment when a pandemic isn't happening. Um, and at each of those, at each of these sort of levels, at each of these circles, um, there are risk factors that could increase the likelihood of needing additional support as they go through treatment. Uh, certain, for example, disease, disease and, and treatment factors. So there are certain types of cancer where treatment might include courses of high dose steroids, a type of medication. And those can have mood, that steroids can have mood and behavior side effects. Um, and that could possibly mean the need for more support. Uh, or maybe um, your child's school hasn't had the experience of working with a family where a kid has cancer before. So maybe your family would benefit from additional connection with um, the school and education program that was discussed at another town hall just a couple of weeks ago. On the resistance or resilience side, maybe a child starts treatment and just just based on their temperament, maybe they're a child that that adjusts easily in a new situation, and that makes it easier to connect with nurses, to communicate their needs, to let people know what's going on, and, and um, that helps with adjustments, adjustment. Or maybe ha a family has a strong support from the neighborhood, and so they don't have to worry about things like cooking dinner during treatment weeks. Um, so it's not just one child or family is re resilient and, and one is not. There's a whole bunch of different factors that that um, influence the situation and balance out in different ways. And of course, adjustment is not just one moment in time, <laughs> but can have its peaks and val valleys over the course of treatment. So even in a, in a case of um, a well-adjusted uh, child, a well-adjusted family, Treatment is still hard, and, and we absolutely expect there to be some distress. Starting saying, of course, of course they feel bad. Um, they have cancer, and, and that's not just physically, that's emotionally. Um, increased stress or regression, changes in behavior in the first few weeks of diagnosis um, really isn't an immediate cause for concern. Um, even a loss of a milestone when we talk about regression. Maybe your three-year-old um, was just about potty trained but then starts wetting the bed at night again. Um, it's, it's okay, that's all right. Um, and on the other hand, some caregivers can wonder if uh, maybe an underwhelmed reaction, like everything is normal, can be okay. And the answer to that is yes as well. So, so not to be contradictory, but in summary, big feelings can be an appropriate reaction and um, acting like you're not that phased can also be an appropriate reaction. Um, healthy coping is absolutely possible and most kids are resilient and do well, that refrain that we'll, we'll keep return, returning to. Um, and it doesn't have to mean if they seem like they're doing well, it doesn't have to mean that they're in denial or secretly suffering, um, especially if they're given the space to talk about and express their feelings when they need to. And um, Dr. Nagy will talk more about that as well. So, so this graphic um, gives sort of a simplified trajectory of what we what we often see for families. Um, you know, sort of going along, and then there's this major event, say the cancer diagnosis, and there's, of course, understandably, a significant increase in distress in one way or the other around the time of diagnosis, and then plateaus for a while, and then eventually most people return, most families return to normal function over time. And it's, it's a, a very accurate graphic. Um, if I was gonna <laughs> redraw it, the reality can be sometimes a little bit more complicated and it can feel less like um, a straight arrow and a little bit more like a roller coaster uh, back to normal functioning, even if overall the change is in the right direction. And that's because Again, it's the diagnosis, but then there's the entire course of treatment and transition after treatment, and certain parts of um, that journey can be more difficult than others, and that can vary from family to family as well. Um, so this slide highlights some aspects of treatment or moments during treatment that can lead to increased stress or distress for certain kids. 
Maybe it's hospital stays. Maybe it's um, certain medications. Maybe it's disconnection from friends and family. Maybe it's um, a change in treatment plan, or maybe it's the transition after treatment and back to school. Those can be times to look out for, since we know there are times that can be a little tougher, to look out, keep a closer eye on your kids. Um, understandable for there to be some increased um, distress during those times. They may need some additional support um, until their adjustment catches up. Uh, one of my favorite things about working in pediatrics is, <laughs> is how different um, a two-year-old is from an 18-year-old. And so we wanted to break down what some common reactions you might see um, based on age group. Um, because something that might be a common or not too concerning reaction from a toddler, we'll go back to that, starting to wet their bed at night again, um, would, raise, would raise more of a red flag for, for a school-age child or for a teenager. Um, so infants and young children, um, they have more difficulty separating from familiar caregivers. They might have um, intense reactions when they're going back into a room or part of the hospital where they've had needles before, painful procedures, um, may have some temporary delay or, or loss of milestones, and temporary is, um, I'll emphasize temporary there. Um, School-aged children may be more focused on not being able to go to school, missing friends. They're at an age where they're able to express more sadness and anger over the loss of their, their normal life because of being sick. Similarly, teenagers will talk a lot about missing friends, may focus on appearance changes, um, and but even more so than the younger younger school aged kids may focus on things like um, loss of independence and change in their identity. Other things you may notice that can um, happen across uh, across development. Themes related to treatment may come out in play um, or in stories. Um, you know, that might be imaginary play for younger children focused on trips to the hospital or giving needles to their, their stuffed animals or dolls, or um, for older kids and teens in creative ways in art or in writing. Completely understandable to be in a bad mood and have low energy when you're feeling um, when you're feeling sick and the reassuring thing to look out for here is bouncing back and feeling better once, and mood recovery once they're feeling better from a physical perspective. Um, it's also really understandable um, and not uncommon for caregivers to have questions about, my, my kid, my teen doesn't seem to wanna to talk about these things. Is that a problem? And the answer is, not necessarily, <laughs> and um, uh, a child or a teenager who wasn't speaking a lot about their feelings ahead of time, before all of this, wouldn't necessarily start now. Um, and my advice in that situation, our advice in that situation, is um, to model open communication yourself, to, to show talking about your feelings, um, to talk about treatment, things that they might uh, feel concerned about bringing up themselves in, a, in an age-appropriate way, and Dr. Nagib will talk more about that. Um, and know that their readiness to talk may shift um, as they progress through treatment and as they grow up themselves and as they develop and become more mature. So leaving the, leaving the space to talk and following their lead for when they're ready. So that leads, leads us into the next section. Um, what what you can do as as caregivers um, to help support uh, kids during treatment. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say if we could have had fireworks go off on that last slide with those last two bullet points, we probably would have done it. It definitely is a is a really really helpful um, piece of advice to think on is this idea of following the lead of your child and, and, and things can change week to week. So what can I do? Um, that brings us to topic three, how you as the caregiver can help emotionally support your child. Well, there's a lot that you can do to help support your child, um, but before we get into a couple of the 
tips that we have listed here on the slide. One thing I really do want to share that I feel like is um, is really significant and something that I feel like even as therapists sometimes we struggle with is um, is not trying to necessarily fix your child's feelings. Um, if we attempt to do that, sometimes it just doesn't, you know, it doesn't bring us to the success that we're hoping for. And we can often just land with disappointment, frustration, discouragement. Um, but really that being with your child, being present with them, helping them cope, tolerate, manage, that means the world. And, and, and that's really what the goal is. So our first uh, tip listed here is something that I'm sure you're all very familiar with is helping life feel as normal as possible. Where you can keep routine interactions with friends and family and lifestyle in, gen in general, um, you know, the same as it's always been. I know that's, you know, a much bigger ask than it seems on this simple um, slide. But I also want to point out that normal is more than just the fun parts of life, right? It's not normal is not an every day at Disney World. It definitely also means sometimes, you know, my mom or dad might frustrate me and I might get annoyed when they tell me no and I still have rules or there might still be times that I get bored. All of those things still communicate safety because it is in that normalcy. It's not as though everything in their environment has changed quickly and then they almost get this, this underlying message, something's wrong, it's time to panic. So we just wanted to also share this small clip where um, parents themselves from their own perspective sort of speak to this point. So John, if we could start that clip, thank you. When you get that diagnosis, you have the treatment plan, and now you're going home, it's important to try to pull the pieces of your normal life that you can apply to what now is your new normal so that that gives some semblance of what normal should look like for your family. I had to stay focused, and I had to stay very much, you know, nope, this is what we're going to do. This is what you need to do and um, keep his spirits up. And the same thing with siblings, his sister. She needed to feel that sense of normal and still have time with mom and dad that was fun and going to picnics. I mean, Jaden was um, still in treatment and we took him, we did the pumpkin patch at Halloween. We did the tree cutting for Christmas. We, did, we didn't miss those things with the kids because I felt that it was something, you know, that they both still needed to do. It was, this is life and it's normal and chemo and cancer was just, okay, it crept in for a little while, but you know, we're going to continue doing what we do. That sense of normal for them has been yanked, the carpet's been yanked out from under them, and it, trying to get that again, it, it, you know, that, that piece of it is, is, is important, you know, just as important as the, as the physical treatment mm -hmm. um, of the cancer and, and, you know, all that, you know, is, is really, that's, that's, they'll draw their strength from their parents. I think they also draw their strength from those other places, um, you know, and that's, and that's their way of sort of coping and getting through, you know, all of this. You know, because as much as it's changed for you, for them, it's tenfold. Okay, so we're just going to try to pull up the PowerPoint again. All right, great. I could do that. <laughs> okay. okay, that was pretty good. <laughs> there we go. So moving on to the next box, keep checking in. Remind your child that you're always there to talk. Try to make time even once a week to sit down with your child free of distractions and just catch up with them. It doesn't have to be anything dramatic or related to cancer or necessarily feeling sad, but it's kind of just opening up this space with your child. Um, consistently so that they know that if ever anything is on their mind, you're, you're there to listen. And family time, of course, is very important. Next is, unfortunately, be kind to yourself. One of the tips that caregivers understandably usually put on the back burner. But it is really important to give yourself a break. Perfection is not realistic, not the goal. You can't control everything. 
um, really just as much as you send your message the message to your child that you want them to just do your best we you know we all have to kind of follow the same advice um, it's also important to sometimes model how you manage those difficult emotions yourself at times it's, it's in a way it kind of gives permission for um, your child to also learn that their feelings are okay too and that they don't need to hide them. And then finally seek help. You obviously might begin to really get concerned and when in doubt, we're always here. It doesn't hurt to get a professional opinion um, and sometimes it's just a matter of a few recommendations that can make a world of difference. All right, so other things to consider. Um, those tough questions that uh, you know are just heartbreaking sometimes to hear like why are they staring at me what do I do if they ask me why I look like this or why I lost my hair um, sometimes it can be really helpful to come up with an approach with your child that feels right for them whether it's sort of I'm gonna walk away and ignore it or I'm gonna give a signal to my you know, my parents or another adult around so that they can step in and kind of help me navigate it, or whether it's even coming up with a, mes a message that your child is comfortable giving. Um, some other questions, however, can be even more challenging, like, why is this happening to me? Um, I wanna empower, empower caregivers to always realize that as much as it feels completely counterintuitive, to say I don't know to your child, sometimes there's safety in just even realizing that your child is not the only one that doesn't know and that it's okay to say I don't know, I wish I knew too. But it's also really important to always, always communicate to your child as I'm sure everyone listening has that they are not to blame for their current situation. Then the other thing is about behavior. Um, behavioral activation is a concept that we, and a tool that we often use in therapy, um, especially with children that seem to be struggling with their mood, feeling sad, just feeling low. Um, daily activities, staying in touch with friends, remaining active, all those things are important to mood. Um, like new hobbies, new interests, projects at home, um, meeting up with friends virtually or maybe safely outside in context of the pandemic and of course within reason of you know treatment certainly doesn't always make that feel very possible to your child if they're not feeling well but um, as consistently as possible throughout the week um, when they're feeling up to it it, it is important and then this other bullet is a little bit of a tricky one because whenever we want to encourage what we know is gonna be healthy, um, whether it comes to their physical well-being, making sure that they're eating, drinking, taking their medication, or whether it comes to their emotional needs, needing to be up with activity a little bit, not lying in bed all day long, um, if they're feeling up to doing something else. Sometimes that can translate to pressure um, for children and, and actually can oftentimes start to result in some tension and conflict. But it's important to remind your child that you're not angry with them, you're not disappointed in them, you know they're trying their best, it's just you have to just keep pushing through it together. All right, when should I consider getting more help? That brings us to our next topic. What are the warning signs for needing more support? Please, please, please trust your intuition as a caregiver. It is more powerful than you know. Check in with the experts if you observe a real shift and things don't seem to be getting any better. We're not talking just a day or two, but you know, if, if you're moving on to close to two weeks and things still seem to be kind of hanging in there in that low place, um, you know, please start to alert your team. If you notice that something is surprising for your child because you're the expert on your child and you know them best, um, you know, it might be time to to bring other supports into the picture. Natalie and Molly. 
Doctors Nikita and McGregor, there is a question in the chat about this. If, as a parent, um, someone knows that their child or adolescent may need support and they'd like to identify a person in the community, what would be their starting point? Um, one of the suggestions I would make would be to to connect with the social worker from the ONCO team who can also work with the broader psychosocial team to identify appropriate resources in the community. Uh, that could potentially be a starting point in terms of getting therapy for that uh, child, adolescent, or young adult. But I'm wondering if you have other suggestions as well. I think that's the best one, quite honestly, because I think, you know, our team is really well versed on providing referrals for, for families in the community. Often, you know, even if a family just doesn't live very close, it's not realistic. Um, my other thought that I, I usually recommend to families is psychologytoday.com. I use it to find my own referrals, and I've often encouraged family and friends um, as well as patients to check out that website because you can filter according to what insurance plan you have and your zip code and find somebody nearby. Molly, I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that. Ah, that's exactly what I was thinking. I agree completely. It's nice because... The, the social worker team here may have some um, particular ideas as well about um, a community resource uh, that would be familiar with working with um, a kid, a child with cancer or their sibling or their family, um, so might have um, uh, some added, will definitely have some added expertise there. I agree. A second part to this uh, question, and you may um, want to address this either now or later is that treatment transitions can create, I think, some more uh, distress, anxiety, or, or other challenges, not only for families, but for the patients as well. And I don't know if you want to try and address, you know, not only is on treatment challenging, but for some, moving off treatment can be difficult also. Um, and then there's the transition to survivorship. But if that's something else that you might incorporate into your response, that would be great. So I, I feel like, Molly, um, we did have a slide earlier kind of speaking to, um, I guess, the non-linear process of, of coping, um, not just because a child shifts with their own adjustment and their comfort level as time goes on, but also because many different things related to treatment, coming off of treatment, all of those things can, can start to shift the way a child might be coping. And oftentimes, unfortunately, there are wells that we still sometimes will feel are within reason because it is any transition is difficult for anybody, let alone a child and a child that's under undue stress um but but i yeah i think kind of along with that point when you know when we went over it earlier the idea of coming off of treatment is is it doesn't mean that everything is just going to kind of snap back to the way that it was before and sometimes extra support is is super helpful at that time i i agree and i we will go through more specifically um uh, members of our psychosocial team and um, we are here during treatment and we're here during the transition um, um, into survivorship and off treatment um, and can still be resources during that time or if that's a time that um, people prefer to sort of try to get back into more community resources can help with referrals there as well. Um, I think that, that graphic that I had where um, it shows, you know, an increase distress, in distress and then slowly coming back um, down to more normal functioning over time, um, for better or for worse, is something that, that families may go through, you know, that, that moment, that little explosion can be the diagnosis, but it can also be um, other stressors that come at different times. And sometimes anticipating that that something will be difficult um, can help us to act proactively and get some of those supports in place um, ahead of time or not wait too long to access the, those supports if we need them and can make, can help uh, sort of decrease the, you know, keep the response, the distress from getting too high, sort of moderate that response. 
a great question. Yay, I like not having to keep talking the whole time. That was good. <laughs> All right. Um, so again, just please uh, do not ignore your intuition if you feel like something is wrong. Um, and this slide, although it seems only fair that one area of stress should go out the exit when another one enters, we know, unfortunately, that that's not how life works and certainly if there were any if there was anything going on that your family was trying to handle before diagnosis um it certainly didn't just kind of disappear the minute that diagnosis came into the picture and there are some factors that sometimes make it even harder to cope when cancer does come in and when that is the case a higher level of support can be helpful so some pre-existing things like an emotional or behavioral challenges before cancer diagnosis, um, prior loss of a, of a good friend or family member possibly due to illness, difficult relationships or strained relationships with caregivers, which I just want to say in the teenage years can be a particular challenge as well. Um, maybe a child that even before um, diagnosis kind of had very few friends or difficulty f making friends, sometimes that can make the adjustment difficult because sort of treatment just brings in some unavoidable additional isolation at times. Body image concerns certainly can also get worse given the side effects of treatment and the way that treatment can often impact the body. And, uh, and of course, developmental differences that can impact ability to understand or communicate can also make adjustment to a cancer diagnosis very challenging. Could my child be struggling with depression? So I think sometimes what is difficult to really put our finger on is the difference between, you know, expected adjustment to stress and then something like a diagnosis of depression or anxiety. So as we go through the next two slides, it is important to remember that flags should start to rise if one, you're noticing that these changes are becoming pretty persistent. And, you know, again, like we said before, going a couple of weeks without it necessarily improving. Also, not just one or two symptoms in isolation, but you're noticing a few things starting to cluster together. And then finally, you're finding that these changes are really starting to interfere with daily life. So things, some symptoms for depression might be persistent, sad or irritable mood, wanting to be more by themselves, withdrawing from others, guilt about being a burden um, on family or not feeling like they can be fun when around their friends anymore, loss of interest in activities, even when they're feeling okay, they just don't seem to wanna do the things they used to love. Um, changes in sleep, appetite, focus. This is tricky because obviously for a child going through treatment, these disturbances come often come into the picture anyway. So please make sure your first pass is always with the medical team to help you kind of tease that out. And then sometimes you might notice your child is having kind of random stomach aches or headaches and uh, the medical team doesn't seem to think that it is related to um, their medication or or to treatment. Um, at that point, we might start to look that this might be a symptom of stress. And then, of course, if you notice your child is starting to become indifferent to wanting to even get better or refusing treatment all, after all, that's a, or overall, that that's definitely a concerning sign as well. And then anxiety. We often find that anxiety and depression are joined at the hip, so you're probably gonna see a lot of overlap with this slide too. But again, um, some signs to look out for, excessive worry that seems to be, you know, a pretty regular thing interfering with life. An unusual degree of attachment, like a lot of clinginess with our little ones or maybe more distant um, than they typically are. Significant aggression or panic during procedures, uh, panic attacks, nightmares, again, headaches, stomach aches, tics, anything that, that you've already checked with the medical team and they're thinking it's not related to treatment, it could be stress. And then, um, you know, sometimes even flashbacks in the middle of the day when they're remembering a traumatic memory of treatment, that can also be a sign of some pretty bad anxiety, as well as, again, treatment refusal.
And finally, we hope families don't ever have to run into this. But again, as we said earlier, it's just always important to stay informed. Um, when it comes to concerns of self-harm or not wanting to be alive anymore, we also don't want to make this a complete taboo topic for kids where they feel like they just can't say anything about it when they when they are starting to feel that way. So, I mean, if you're starting to notice, um, and again, back to we said, sitting down with your child on a regular basis and talking with them can also open up a window. If they feel like this starts to creep into their thoughts, they can share it with you. But if you ever do start to notice any language or behavior that you start to get concerned um, that they are starting to have these, these types of thoughts, it's important to alert uh, the team. But again, if it is a, a more of an immediate threat or doubt that your child is going to stay safe in the moment, please don't wait for the team to get back to you. You want to take your child immediately to the hospital, just as you would with any other emergency. So, okay. Molly, it's your cue. That's all right. So, you know, we've talked about some of these, um, these signs to look out for, a really wonderful overview there, and um, talking about the what to do, what to do with that, um, uh, and, and we're here to help. And we want to talk a little bit about the oncology psychosocial team. So social work, um, amazing group of people who I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar, very familiar with, um, and our social workers are experienced in pediatrics um, and in, in cancer. Um, they can be helpful with supporting adjustment to um, to your child's diagnosis and treatment plan, um, accessing, we were talking about referrals, CHOP resources, um, community resources, uh, whether that's related to family care, social security, transportation, um, behavioral health referrals in the community, um, connecting you with other, you know, cancer-related organizations, foundations, camps, really just a, a wealth of information and support. And child life um, are uh, specialists who um, have expertise in minimizing the stressful aspects of, of illness um, and the healthcare setting uh, for, for, for kids and their families um, can help develop coping techniques um, with, uh, with therapeutic play, preparation, developmentally appropriate education. Um, help to help kids to feel more comfortable in the healthcare setting, which just is so, so valuable. Um, uh, really wonderful sibling support as well, helping to give um, age appropriate support and education. How do you talk about this with, with a sibling? Um, and um, helping caregivers, helping, um, helping you all to have the right words to talk about, to talk about some of these. Um, procedures or treatments or what to expect. Um, psychology, <laughs> I will, uh, and Dr. McGee, if Natalie, feel free to jump in. Um, uh, psychologists are um, uh, able to help when some of this distress, emotions really begin to interfere um, with with medical treatment, with ability to enjoy things, with ability to function, and the psychologists um, in the psychosocial team are, are especially focused in oncology here, so have real expertise there. Um, sometimes when you might wanna, wanna reach out or get a referral to a psychologist, you're noticing intense ongoing distress um, for your, your teen, your child, um, help for yourself as a caregiver um, to, be able to best care for your child and to support your child. Um, processing fears about treatment or medication that's interfering with medical care. Um, and bringing back to that great question about uh, various challenges transitioning back to a different phase of treatment or back to regular life after treatment. Um, and sometimes helpful to get psychology involved early on if there's a history of, of behavioral or developmental concerns that um, predate a cancer diagnosis and that means someone might benefit from more support during treatment. Uh, and psychiatry, um, uh, a psychiatrist uh, has similar focuses, um, but psychiatrists are medical doctors with 
expertise in, um, in treating behavioral health issues as well. Um, and a psychiatrist that you would see at CHOP would have um, background in working with um, kids and uh, who have, who have um, medical issues or cancer. Um, psychiatrists can help with diagnosing and treating psychiatric symptoms in the context of cancer diagnosis. So um, how medications you might consider or interventions you might consider interact with, um, uh, with cancer treatment or cancer itself, including mood and anxiety disorders, anxiety, um, ADHD, um, prescribing medications to target psychiatric side effects of certain cancer and cancer treatments, talking about steroids again, for example, and um, <clears throat> managing ongoing treatment of psychiatric disorders that were present prior to the cancer diagnosis. That's not all. <laughs> There's um, many other wonderful team members who um, we just <laughs> had or time limit on how many slides, but um, the outpatient education coordinators who um, had, we heard from a couple of weeks ago um, do amazing things assisting with school-related factors. Um, creative arts therapists can help um, with our expressing and coping through artistic avenues, art and music, integrative medicine. Um, have uh, you know a variety of, or, and a wide array of um, modalities help manage stress and physical symptoms, massage, yoga, acupuncture, um, and the chaplaincy and spiritual care team um, offer meetings with families for prayer, spiritual support, um, and uh, and other support during that time. Okay, and this is going to be the last concept that we sort of review in today's presentation, is the idea of post-traumatic growth. And as um, Dr. McGregor earlier uh, touched on, it is a really pretty amazing phenomenon um, that can occur in the face of pretty significant adversity where people struggles, uh, especially the hardest ones, can can kind of foster reflection and growth when it comes to themselves, when it comes to uh, relationships and connections with others, and as well as a new appreciation for life and a, and a kind of uh, a more developed outlook, um, you know, and positive outlook on the world. Uh, and survivors often just kind of can speak to the fact that uh, at least many that I've run into when even patients that have really struggled with depression or anxiety um, in their journey with cancer that they've even sometimes said that they wouldn't they wouldn't take that away from their lives because it's helped contribute to the person that they are today and I think that's that's a pretty that's a pretty incredible message. But again, not everybody experiences post-traumatic growth. I mean, this is, it's one really, really difficult life event, just, just as loss is, um, you know, many of the really difficult things that life can throw at you and everybody does cope differently and has different factors coming into the picture. And however it is that your journey goes, um, I think our, what we're hoping our, you know, message to you is that we're here to walk that journey with you and to help you through it. Um, we also have, you know, closing on this other brief video that we hope really kind of speaks to this concept. I would be lying if I said I don't have a fear of needles because I still do. And this is a box full of needles at home. I remember my first injection. I was hiding from the nurses. I didn't want to see a needle. I didn't want to hear about a needle, but then I got used to it. I still don't like needles. I don't think anyone does. The camera, like it took what was in your brain and brought it out into the life. Like after you go through like chemotherapy and cancer, you see the world differently. You don't see it the way you used to before. Like people say, um, a photo is worth a thousand words. It's a different way than just like explaining needles. You know, you just take a picture of the box and it like the photo shows how much needles you've had and it's scary and it's brave at the same time. It's, 
it's the way you the way you see the picture that matters. You know, from the very beginning of my diagnosis, I felt my spirituality increase. Praying honestly brings ease into my heart and gives me hope because I feel like once you have that connection, that direct connection to God, like you're literally talking to God, something positive will always come out of it. So to talk about spirituality in that sense that it strengthens me and allows me to move forward throughout this very difficult time in my life um, was really important. It was kind of like a little scary just to like put my thoughts out there, like taking a picture of what I thought and sharing it with everyone else. The most sentimental one to me would be the stairs because strength was something I really struggled with because I went into ICU and by the time I came back, like I had no strength in my legs, I had no energy to do anything. I took this picture of my stairs of the basement and of the main floor going up. Treatment went on and I came home very weak and I couldn't come up the stairs. An image that you have in your head might not be the same image as like someone else has. So to have like 17 year old kid who went through cancer, who went through all this stuff and see how I saw it, I feel like it's a different way for them to like imagine two things. Yeah. I'm proud of my photos. Why? Because I feel like they're like a good representation of like what I went through and kind of my story. It's like a car passing to represent how once you get diagnosed, everything happens so quickly. Like there's never a moment for you to just pause and take it all in. It happens so quickly, but you also go through so much. It's not like you just have cancer. So I had surgery and then I got diagnosed and then I went in for staging. And it was like all like one day after the next and never had time to just sit down and be like, okay, this is what I have and now I'm gonna deal with it. No, it was like, okay, boom, boom, boom. You didn't just have cancer, you had cancer, but you had all these other things running around and you're like, okay, what am I gonna do with my friends? Like, how am I gonna tell them that I have cancer when I haven't even had time to process it myself? And then you tell them and they don't know how to react. And then you're nervous because you're like, oh my God, are they still gonna be my friends now that I have this? But yeah, it's like you don't, you don't have time to just stop and kind of like take it all in. Thank you so much for your presentation today. If there are any final questions, please feel free to let us know. Or again, as has been stated a number of times today, please reach out to your psychosocial team. Uh, anyone on the team would be happy to, to provide support, answer any questions that you might have, and, and work with you and your family. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Bye.